Hello everyone and welcome to Media Pitching, Eight More Fatal Flaws brought to you by Wasabi Publicity and Pitch Rate. This is the second call in a three-part series. My name is Hannah Collison, Client Services at Wasabi, and I'll be moderating our webinar today. Our webinar today will last approximately 45 minutes, which will be 30 minutes of presenting and then some time for Q&A. We may go a little over, we did last time, but we'll try to stick to that time frame. We'll start with introductions before doing a quick review of the eight pitching flaws covered in our last event. And after that, we'll dive right into an, um, another eight fatal pitching flaws from our guest journalist. Like I mentioned, there'll be Q&A time at the end, and then we'll announce the date for our next call, which will be the last, the third and final in this media pitching series. Please feel free to chat about our event today using our hashtag media pitching. It's in green on your screen right now. And after today's call, we'll be more than happy to answer questions via social media. You can find us at PitchRate on Facebook and Twitter. And so on to our next slide. Shortly, I'm going to hand you over to Michelle Tennant. But first, let me just uh, give you a quick overview on who she is. With 24 years of global PR experience, Michelle Tennant Nicholson has seen PR transition from typewriters to Twitter. She's co-owner and chief creative officer of Wasabi Publicity, a firm recognized by the Associated Press, Christian Science Monitor, PR Week, and Good Morning America for unique business leadership. Michelle specializes in breaking news and has been called a five-star publicist by Good Morning America producer Mabel Chan. Let me give you a peek into Michelle's world. Yesterday, she scored Family Circle magazine. Last week, she scored The Huffington Post. Last month, Ladies Home Journal, this summer, Inc., and in the spring, Oprah. National media such as The Wall Street Journal, Larry King Live, CNN, BBC, Fox, NBC, ABC, Dr. Phil, and more, all rely on Michelle for sources and story ideas. Michelle blogs about PR at StorytellerToTheMedia.com, and due to her master's degree in human development, she contributes to The Huffington Post's GPS for the Soul section in a blog called The Art of AHA, How to Find Health, Wealth, and Love in the 21st Century. Now, Michelle, I know you and your business partner, Drew Gerber, are out to change the world by changing the conversations that people have. So thank you so much for leading today's call. It's really my pleasure, Hannah. Thanks so much for your lovely introduction. And I want to introduce my uh, associate today on the call with me, my co-host, Michael Bellicove. So let me tell you a little bit about Michael. It's really a pleasure to have him on with us in this three-part series. It's just, it's just awesome, it's, you know, the fact that he can spend time with us. So let me tell you who he is. Michael Bellicove is a magazine columnist, a book author, and a blogger who writes about entrepreneurship, marketing, business planning, and corporate communications emerging technologies, legal issues, and more. The third edition of his latest co-authored book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Facebook, was published last fall. Michael writes the Ask a Geek column for Entrepreneur Magazine, the Business End blog for Forbes Magazine, the Ed Tech Matters column for Today's Campus Magazine, and is a contributing writer to NewHope360.com. Previously, Michael launched, managed, and sold a Boulder, Colorado-based Internet startup, worked in acquisitions for John Wiley and & Sons and Pearson, and worked in a variety of staff and executive team roles for startups and a variety of not-for-profit organizations. A 1986 graduate of Keystone College and a member of Keystone College's Board of Trustees, when he's not working, Michael can be found dreaming about training for a half marathons while trail running and enjoying life with family and friends in Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. And, and yes, there are trails in, outside of Las Vegas, Nevada, in case anyone wants <laughs> I'm sure everybody's like, where's that? We would like to see that. And when I head to Las Vegas, which I've never been, by the way, but my business partner, Drew Gerber, always tells me is lovely, then we'll go on the trail running together because I love trail running. Sounds great. All right, well, let's go into the meat of the day. So I'm going to go to the next slide, everybody. Let's review what we did last time. Yeah, this is pretty important. So there's there's a lot of things that we'll be referring to in 
uh, pitching flaws number nine through 16, so the second eight. But let's go through the, like you said, let's go through the first ones. The, the first flaw that I pointed out the last time we spoke is referencing someone else's coverage of the exact same news. And the issue here is that um, if you're pitching uh, a journalist and you're, and you're telling them uh, that you were recently featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or another publication, um, that doesn't really do what you think it does. Um, you think that I'll take you more seriously or want to write about you for fear. Um, well, you, you just think that's going to give you more credibility. Um, from my perspective, it doesn't really work in that. From that perspective, um, I think you need to just just be cognizant of the fact that the you know stories can only be told so many times. And as journalists, we want to feel like we're the first ones telling them. Yeah. The uh, the second one is this whole notion of assuming that I care. Um, pitching me, and I, I use the word journalist and me interchangeably, and that may not be entirely correct because I don't speak for all journalists. I don't even speak for the publications that I write for. Um, but I'll, I'll say myself and journalists almost interchangeably. But pitching a journalist before researching their particular niche or focus, um, you know, do they write profiles, news, how-to, investigation, something else, is another common flaw that uh, startups, entrepreneurs, and their agencies make. Um, asking me what I'm working on is always the best way to it's always sort of the best approach to take. Um, not referencing supporting data. This has to do with, with a lot of uh, uh, pitches that come through that make really wild claims um, about being the best selling this or the most popular that without backing it up with third party data. Um, it's definitely a misstep when this happens and I see it all the time. Um, it turns out that PR hacks are the ones that are more likely to do this than, uh, than you are as a, uh, you know, as a skilled uh, PR professional. Um, but just make sure that you're on top of your game and, and know that people like me, journalists, are going to be asking you for documentation around those kind of claims, and that might take the story in a completely different direction. And by PR hacks, do you mean that just you know people who are trying their, to do it yourself? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I could mean that. I, I, I could also mean um, those that uh, just really don't know what the heck they're doing. Gotcha. Um, I mean, I think we all, in a professional capacity in one respect or another, because of the commoditization of of really everything in, in the written form, there are a lot of people that have come forward and said that they're PR professionals when, when really what they are are just kind of people hacking at it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, because you all are paying attention to what we're doing with pitchrate.com and these teleseminar series, you're not a hack, okay? Go. Just <laughs> go ahead. The, uh, the fourth one is crying wolf. Um, and if you're too young to remember Aesop's fables, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, Look it up and read it because sending sending me a press release for every little thing that's happening at your company or your client is just going to numb my response to anything serious that you may have to offer. So stop stop crying wolf and, and be picky about what you put out there from a PR perspective. Uh, number five, remaining mum about your competitors. Um, this one speaks to the fact that you've, you've made a pitch. It's something that I'm interested in. Uh, we talk about it for a little while, and then I ask you, um, you know, whom, whom your, your strongest competitors are. And uh, you're just absolutely unwilling to answer the question on behalf of your client or the client themselves is, and it, it kind of makes me a little suspicious. More often than not, I'm probably not going to write about your company, but I'm going to write I'm going to write a rundown piece. Um, and a rundown is is just pretty much you know the you know here are the here are the players in the space. Here's what you need to look for. I might use your client or you if you're pitching me as the primary expert for the piece, the you know the subject matter expert and the voice that introduces it. Um, but as a responsible, as someone who's responsible for writing business journalism and not profiles, um, you know, I like to include access to others, and, and chances are you probably have competitors. Um, the sixth one is guerrilla distribution of your press release. Um, and this, the reason I put, we put this in there last time is that it, in this day and age, it's, it's easy for any business owner or PR agency to cast a really wide net with a press release. Um, but when you distribute your news using online uh, press release distribution platforms, it can dilute whatever it is that I may end up publishing about you. And as we're going to discover a little bit later today, um, diluting the news that I'm going to be writing or that a journalist is going to be writing is actually detrimental to the journalist, and we'll discuss that a little bit further today. Uh, not giving not giving a journalist uh, enough lead time, pretty straightforward on this one. You know, you, you, you can't expect or really have any expectations at all in, in PR, but you can't expect to contact somebody like me on a, on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, invite me to an event that's taking place on Thursday, an event that's got graphic design associated with it, flyers, you know, a whole Facebook page for it, and you know, only give me two days, two days notice. Same thing for a story. Um, you know, you you want to, if you trust the journalist, give them as much time as possible to kind of get out, get out ahead of it. And then the last one was leading with rhetoric and hyperbole. Um, and uh, you know, if if you don't know this, uh, journalists are, are born skeptics and critics. Um, 
and if if your news is really news, you know it's something that we'll run with. So j- just give us the straight facts. Um, you don't need to, uh, you know, reference someone in your organization as being a guru, an innovator, an industry leader. Uh, for some journalists, um, not myself, but I guess if I have the wrong interaction with someone from a PR standpoint, it just makes us want to prove that you're not. So skip the rhetoric and the hyperbole in favor of just the standard who, what, when, where, and why, and you know, let us do our job in that respect. So I just want to underscore something that Michael is saying to everybody. If I'm going to go back one slide, so let's. If you're thinking about, you know, most of the so number one through eight, the way that I think about these flaws, really preparing your pitch, you know, warming up that pitch. I love using baseball analogies all the time. And number one, when he's talking about referencing someone else's coverage of the exact same news, which I really started to think about the way that I do that. And you want to think about, like, is this a scoop for somebody? And it's it's almost like a special gift. And then you're going to be actually pitching that to your favorite players. And that's really what I want to underscore here is that a lot of times when we talk about pitching news or getting uh, the information out there and we're helping clients or you're doing it yourself. We want to get the news out there far and wide. And sometimes when you are eager to do that, you might do it in a way that blasts the information to a lot of people and not specific information to a handful of special people. And just like any party, you know, like if you're going to have a small intimate party at your house, you're just going to call and send some VIP invitations to the people that you really care about. And that's really what we're talking about here is if you've got some special news, you want to make sure that your favorite media context get that first. And that's what I think a lot of people overlook, Michael, in, in today's, you know, oh, hurry up and get something out there world, you know. Yeah. Well, let's move on to what we're talking about today, eight more pitching flaws. And again, you can actually tweet about what you're learning, hashtag media pitching. And one of the things that I want you to think about today is a, is a large context about what we're talking about is the actual play. Like once you're in that relationship, then what are the flaws that you might do that could trip it up? And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So with that, um, oh, we've got this replay here, this little uh, – if you – if you missed the last one and you want to actually do a, a replay of the review, what we just did, the actual one, you can see this bit.ly right here. And so you can actually have that and make a note of that. I think we've also put that out on um, pitch rate feeds and, and also on our Twitter and Facebook accounts as well. And we'll always get you this link um, afterward if you'd like to watch this. So moving into today, anything you want to say about that, Michael? Yeah, no, just that uh, that that uh, that that's available through uh, through YouTube, um, and it's very comprehensive. So the, the list that we just flew through, where I just said the eight, the first eight fatal flaws, I, we dive much much deeper into all of them, and that we yes. did that last month. Yeah. Yeah, and so if you feel like, oh, I missed the first one, exactly, it's out there, it's on YouTube, and it doesn't cost you anything, that kind of thing. Just go look at it, get the information. All right. So here we are, pitching flaw number nine. Yeah, so Michelle, you actually just kind of alluded to this a little bit before. As a as a journalist, I'm always able to tell whether someone who's pitching me a story is working from a distribution list or is pitching me directly. And I'm a huge proponent and advocate for using a distribution list. Rather than casting that net so ridiculously wide, um, taking the time to actually um, identify who the proper journalist is so that you're not wasting your time in PR Pitching and tracking down and following up a whole bunch of distribution, a whole bunch of you know press releases or, or emails that you've sent out that just really aren't for uh, the journalist that you're trying to pitch. So I'll uh, you know just today in my email I have yet another follow-up message from somebody about something that they sent me maybe a week week and a half ago that I didn't reply to, and it's uh, it's a very you know nicely worded piece. It's just hey you know Michael just hope your day is going well. Just wanted to follow up with you on the release below. See if you have any interest in talking to so and so. And I'm not suggesting that that if I don't reply, it means I'm not interested. There there is a chance that I missed the email, uh, that I didn't get the voicemail, that um, you know you spoke to somebody else at one of the publications that I wrote for, and you thought you spoke to me for a variety of reasons. It may be that I just missed it. But chances are, if if a, if a journalist hasn't responded to you, if they haven't responded to your pitch, um, whether it's by email, by phone, or even you know if anyone is still faxing press releases, um, I'd probably say that eight out of ten times it's, it's just because we're not interested. 
and you know if we had to take the time to respond to every single pitch and query that came in um, you know we might not have the time to you know to spend doing the job that we're that we're responsible for so having a media distribution list that's segmented according to what you were saying Michelle before about you know those those VIPs that you that you want to pitch to first and um, you know really understanding where where do I stand the best chance to receive coverage and do I want to go ahead and and offer those organizations, those news organizations and those writers and journalists first and foremost, maybe um, my news on embargo, which if you're not familiar with the term embargo, we discussed it last time, simply means that you're sharing the news privately um, on a, you know, usually a week ahead of time or two or three days before the press release is going to be dropped and the public will know about the news. So I'd say your media distribution list first and foremost should be segmented according to who you're willing to embargo that news to. And you want to be careful about embargoes so that you don't, you know, like I, I, one of the publications I write for is, is uh, or, or, or web properties is Forbes.com. And there are a lot of writers for Forbes.com. So you don't want to embargo something to me for Forbes that you've also embargoed to two or one other people at Forbes. Um, that's just going to kind of rub me the wrong way. I'm now I'm not the only one covering the story, and it feels like you're kind of just going for an attention grab. So you want to segment that list properly, make sure you have a distribution list, and so your embargoes might be your first wave, the people that you trust that you're going to tell the story ahead of time. You know that their coverage of the news, first and foremost, is going to be great for you and your client. And then your, you know, your, your segmentation after that, your second wave, might be the news organizations that are directly in the path of the news, and the others might be a wider, a wider cast that you, that you send out. But having a distribution list is, I believe, is, is uh, absolutely critical, and it's very obvious when, when, uh, when I receive a pitch that, you know, that it's not coming from a distribution list. It's coming from, you know, your distribution list is everybody. I love this. And I think that one way, if you're wondering, how do I prioritize my media contacts, the first question to ask yourself, and I do this with clients all the time, and it usually stumps them. They have to really think about it. And we ask, you know, in our client intake calls, where do you want to be mentioned? And they often they'll say, oh, I, I just want everybody to know about it. Okay, well, let's start with your top five. And usually it's what they're reading. You know, what are you, how do you get your news? What are your favorite magazines? What are you reading online? Start there. Go to the library or go to a bookstore and thumb through the current periodicals or get online and go to your favorite news sources. You know, there's so much to organize yourself today, but there's something that you're doing where you're being fed the information that interests you, especially if you're in some type of industry like a, an academic industry or a trade industry. There's a way that you're getting information. It might even, you might be surprised if you think about it, it might even be a newsletter. And those are going to be very, you know, very similar strategy, but most of the time a little easier to score than a glossy magazine or a national TV show. You know, Michelle, if I can, re- if I, if yeah, I can, go sorry ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but I can just add Please. to that. I think it starts by understanding who the client stakeholders are. Yes. So who are the influencers? Who are the ones that are, are able to share news and information that, that they find? Where do they go to find their news and information? Once you identify who your client stakeholders are, or if you're listening in on this call because you yourself are an entrepreneur and you're doing pitching yourself and you're, you're managing your own PR effort, who are your business's stakeholders? Well, your stakeholders, if you're a startup and you're funded, uh, one of them is primarily your investors. That's one stakeholder. Are you publishing news for them? No, probably not. So other stakeholders are going to be those that are buying your products and services, those that are influencing um, those who buy your products or services. So I think starting with a stakeholder list and understanding who makes that up, that really that really goes to inform your um, goes to inform your your media distribution list. So great, awesome. Okay, and then the other thing when you were talking about first wave and second wave, of course, you know, because I love the baseball analogy, I was thinking, ooh, first base, second base third base, home run, you know, and when you're getting to the home run and the celebration mode, that's when you can just kind of let the news out and then kind of do your press release distribution. You know, the scoops are over by then, let's face it. Yeah, all right, moving on. Unfortunately, all your clients want a home run. And so you're, true. You know, you're, you're, automatically, true. you're automatically working at a deficit because they, they have an unrealistic expectation that, that they're going to be on Dr. Oz, that they're going to be on Oprah, that they're going to be on the cover of a magazine. And I don't, I don't envy uh, PR pros, you know, that have to deal with those expectations because they're, they're rampant and, and, you know, uninformed. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks for getting that. And sure. to make matters worse, 
you know, you get somebody on the Wall Street Journal on the cover of the Wall Street Journal at that, and then the next day they're like, yeah, but what about what about this TV show? And you're like, oh, my God, I just got you on the Wall Street Journal yesterday. What are you doing talking about, you know, another venue already? But that's the reality of PR, and it's okay. That's just the way it is. Pitching ball actually, number 10. Yeah, that, that's probably a good segue, um, the, the Matthew effect. And I think this is probably something that, that as a PR pro, you have to understand in dealing with people like me. And as a PR pro, it's probably important for you to to try to explain to your clients. So the, the issue here is that almost a half century ago, uh, the sociologist Robert Merton observed that famous scientists often get more credit for a research finding than a lesser or unknown scientist does, even where the work of both the scientists is very similar. And he labeled this phenomenon the Matthew effect after a, a verse in the Bible. I'm not, not really up to my Bible stuff, but I kind of looked it up. It's Book of Matthew 25, 29, which roughly translates into the rich get richer. So in, in other words, um, you, you really have to understand that as a journalist, I'm skeptical. Um, I'm, I'm impervious to hyperbole and rhetoric. And when you, when you tell me that um, your client was just featured yesterday on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, um, as a journalist, I'm thinking, man, you are one greedy son of a gun. So now you want me to write about them too? when there are lesser known other people that are probably just as qualified and uh, you know just as deserving of attention, but you're really, really pushing this one guy and so this or one gal or one company or one solution when there are obviously you know other solutions and others out there. So there are, there are some journalists that that truly do not want to um, carry on the pile on. They, they, they're not really interested in helping your client become a big fish. And and so there therein lies this this huge rub, where that's what you're responsible for as someone who works in PR. And if you haven't explained to your client that you know we're we're dealing with with a really sophisticated journalist here, we're dealing with a sophisticated news organization, and they're not interested in just covering what everyone else has already covered. They're interested in covering it from a different perspective, a different angle, maybe even with a different expert. Um, and you know, mind you, if I if I turn you down for a piece that I'm writing and you're, you know, your understanding of that and you're respectful of that, and I don't mean respectful as in kowtowing to me or to a journalist. I simply mean, you know, you're not, you're not fighting with me per se about it um, or trying to convince me otherwise when I've already made up my mind and you're, you know, we're just wasting each other's time. Chances are I'm probably going to come back to you related to something else because my experience with you was good in rejection. But the real challenge here is for somebody like yourself to explain this to your clients that um that journalists are 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 susceptible to this that they that they're noticing of it and they're they're not uh you know they're not interested in in you know sort of being your voice again yeah i really think that this is important for people to really understand and we i want to underscore here that we're talking about sophistic you know i try to help our clients understand the difference between broadcast and print in today's Internet world, it's it, you know you often get into conversations of like, well, what, what kind of media contact are we talking about? And it, it's helpful to delineate between what I call print and broadcast. And now that may be print online or in a magazine or in a newspaper, you know, all of that. And then there's broadcast again online, on TV, on radio, and so forth. I tend to, uh, in my experience, broadcast journalists. And I'm not talking about investigative journalists, okay? I'm talking about the ones that are making a show. They're going to be more interested in the name dropping that we're talking about for purposes of are you going to help me make a good show on radio, on TV, online? You know, are you going to be entertaining enough? Whereas print journalists who are, you know, they want the scoop, the ser- they, they consider themselves, like you, Michael, a serious journalist, right? Like, I'm not an entertainer. I'm actually <laughs> a serious journalist here. Th- that type is, I, I totally agree that that's what they're looking for is something that uh, is fresh and unique. And, uh, and I've really thought through in my interactions with you on this webinar, hey, maybe I'm actually name dropping too much. You know, and I've kind of pulled back a little bit since I've learned your perspective on that. And I want to thank you for that. 
Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. And again, it's I think it's important to note. It's just my perspective. I don't I don't speak on behalf of our journalists, and I and I really don't speak on behalf of the publications that I write for. Yes, understood. So number eleven. Number eleven, ignoring capacity. This really has to do with my capacity, or or really any journalist's capacity. Um, you know, if you were just to just to sit down and 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 do the math, there are 365 days of the year. I'm not going to be writing 365 stories this year. Uh, there are five business days in a week, and I'm not going to be writing a story every business day of the week. There are holidays mixed in. There's personal time mixed in. There are a number of different publications that I write for, um, and because writing has become such a commodity and journalism has become, in a sense, a commodity with people that started out as bloggers moving into now news reporting, newsrooms are cutting back on traditional journalism. There's more online reporting. Um, you know, there's there are a lot of outlets that you can go to to pitch your your client, your story, your news, your information. But th- we we as writers still have capacity issues. We can only publish so many stories a week, so many p- stories a month, so many stories a year. And not recognizing that that I have a capacity issue is definitely a pitching flaw. What I mean by that is that if you're if you're coming at me with blinders on, and you're treating me like I am the publication itself, like I'm the brand. So pick any of the publications that I write for. And you're not approaching me as as the individual, Michael Belikov, but instead you're approaching me as publication name, December issue, which you've looked at before and you recognize that there are 400 separate pieces of content in there. And you're thinking that I have the capacity to write about you um, and your client and your news and information. Um, you're, you're, you're wildly um, misinformed. And I see this again, you know, quite frequently where, you know, a, a, a PR person will almost express, you know, sort of exacerbation that I didn't get back to them or disappointment that I, that I may have even done a briefing with them but didn't write about their client. And it, it just boils down to capacity. Um, you know, any respectable, uh, appropriate journalist will never take a meeting with your client um, or you, if you're if you're if you're the one pitching on behalf of your own company, and guarantee coverage. So things are always going to come up. News is going to come up before your information is going to come up. I I've been working on a uh, a standard feature for the last uh, five or six weeks that I publish every Friday over at Forbes, and last week I couldn't publish that piece simply because there was other news, um, you know, that had to be reported that was timely, and so that standard feature actually had to you know take a back seat. And luckily, you know, the PR person that I'm working with on that piece was completely understandable. Um, there's a, you know, a good enough relationship there that we've developed trust and they understand that, you know, I'm not yanking their chain per se, but that I just literally couldn't get to it last week. And, you know, hopefully everything works out, uh, you know, we'll be able to get to it tomorrow instead. So understanding capacity um, is really important. Ignoring it is definitely a pitching flaw. Now let me tell you something about, I'm not saying you, Michael, but you, the audience, about a PR, pers- a publicist perspective in this matter. And this is where I have to really educate clients because they get a little uppity when hours are spent giving a media contact the information that they're needing and then they can't be used. It is just part of the game. Yesterday, in fact, I had gotten a um, desperate request from a CNN contact of mine that they needed information about travel. I don't want to get too far into it because I don't, you know, I really love this context, so I don't want to point the fingers in a bad way. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll help you for sure. You know, really good got, uh, media coverage from her in the past, and so I got, you know, I did all this stuff behind the scenes that a lot of media contacts don't ever know. Speaking of capacity, right? One of the things about ignoring capacity is also expecting, I think, too much of your media contact. It's up to us as publicists and do-it-yourselfers to get all the pieces together for you. Right, Michael? You're going to love that if I make your job easier. So beginning in the morning all the way till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it was all about CNN. And I got all these, tra- you know, I got, I got people on the phone, experts on the phone, I got this, I did interviews, da, 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 da. I got this, you know, really cool content together, sent it to my contact, and then by her deadline for me on whether she wanted to even do the interview. This was just for her whether she wanted to interview my sources, okay? At that time when she got it, she goes, I need apps. What is this? I need apps. <laughs> and I said, 
Oh, well, that information would have been useful this morning. <laughs> and she was like, oh, my God, I am so sorry. <laughs> she was so apologetic. She was, thanks for jumping on it anyway. <laughs> so I had just spent, you know, seven hours on nothing that could be used. Hmm. Most people would come after her, right, and be like, why didn't you put it in your first email? Shame on you for getting that. Well, I understand that she's busy, so she forgot the word app in her original request to me. So then I just take the information, I'm going to repurpose it for something else and give it to somebody else. You know, it's not lost, but it's keeping that into perspective about capacity and immediate, you know, for us to ever, and I've had, I've had national TV shows completely take my pitch run with the story, never use any of my sources, never credit me. It's part of the game that we play. You know, and I'm not, I'm just going to come back to them and give them another pitch because one day they'll use my source. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that before we go on to 10, or excuse me, to 12? No, I think that that, that covered it pretty well, yeah. Okay, good. All right, oh, number 12. Yeah, number 12, uh, pitching pitching without cover. And this, this relates to um, to this day and age that we work in and that we live in, where everything, not everything, but there are many, many things that are happening through social media networks and channels and platforms and utilities. And so I've, I've heard in, in discussions and forums like this that, um, uh, you know, one way to get the attention of, of a journalist is to tweet them. And, uh, you know, another way to get the attention of a journalist is to post something on their, on their, uh, their Facebook timeline. Um, and and I I tend to take a, a different view of this. I think that those certainly are um, ways of reaching somebody who's difficult to reach otherwise. Um, I certainly wouldn't start there unless you have literally no other way of reaching them. Um, I I tend to believe that your pitches should be private communications between you and the journalist that you're working for, or at least in the case of me, that they should be. And and my reason for that is because I don't want people that are following me on Twitter or my friends on Facebook or business associates on LinkedIn or any combination of thereof on any of the sites to know what it is that I'm being pitched and what I'm writing. I, wanted, I want to have my publisher receive the credit for that news and information when they publish it or when I'm writing about it on a site where I have direct publishing responsibilities. I want to be the one that reports that news. I want to be the one that shares it. I don't want anyone else to know what I'm working on. And that, that is a bit paranoid, and I, I recognize that, you know, in this day and age of, of social, that may seem antithetical to what a lot of advice is that people are hearing. But I would just say to you that in, sort of in response to that, if that's, you know, sort of a primary objection that you may have to hearing this, that the, 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 news, the news pitching process should still be a, a private, solitary, one-to-one -one process. Um, I get that you're going to be publishing press releases and they're going to be picked up by search engines and, you know, that's going to count towards your, um, you know, your, your, your score with your clients because, you know, you're able to show them URLs and search engine uh, uh, ranking as a result of all that. But I'm not talking about the press release. I'm talking about the pitch. Yeah. I'm talking about, you know, actually tweeting me directly, openly, you know, where, where my followers are seeing that. And it kind of lets the cat out of the bag if it's something that I'm going to be working on. So in my particular case, I have a website. If you just go there, you know, there's a contact form. Um, you know, every publication that I write for uh, usually has a link to my, you know, to my profile and a way to get in touch with me. So that's the best way to always do it, always err on the, on the safe side in that regard. Listen, when it's been my experience that when media contacts have a concern about being scooped by another journalist, it means that they actually have reach. It means they're being read. They actually are um, someone, and in what we call in the PR world an, um, an influencer, someone who's definitely um, they, somebody that you want to cover your news, whatever that is. And so when I hear that from my contacts, and I have heard that a lot, Michael, you're not the only one, I know, I respect that, and I go, okay, this is a player. This is somebody who... Um, we really want in the fold, and to respect that. Yeah. And you know, I should point out that this is not a that, that, that this is a one-way street, because I have actually reached out through public channels to people I'm trying to interview, because for whatever reason they are increasingly difficult to get a hold of through traditional means. 
And I'm thinking about an article that I wrote for Forbes last month or the month before where there's a firm that did some very specific research and uh, it was very enlightening and it hadn't been updated in over a year. And I knew that the that the uh, the metric that they had reported on uh, had a strong likelihood of changing from last year to this year and that it was still very much on people's minds. Well, you go to their website and their their contact page, um, you know, it, it just has a form. I fill the form out. I don't hear anything for a day or two, and I'm on deadline, and I want to do something with this. There's no phone number, the parent company, um, exact same thing on their website, no way to get in touch with them. So I do some deeper research. I find out who the CEO of the company is, and I do research on him. And, of course, I can't find his phone number anywhere, but I am able to finally locate his Twitter account. And so I can't DM him because we're not connected. I can't direct message him because I can only send a direct message to someone who's a contact of mine. So I send an open an open tweet, and I just said, you know, so and so, you know, I'm a journalist. I write for this paper, this publication. I'm interested in I'm interested in talking with you ASAP. And for whatever reason, that's the channel that that person was tuned into, instead of the contact form on their website. And he responded, I think within three or four hours. And I was able to nail down the interview and, and write the story. Okay. You come across a CEO, it's a large corporation like that. I want to pitch them being their publicist. Shame on them. <laughs> yeah, this was, a, this was a small Internet. This one was a small Internet startup. I mean, uh, I'm not, just, not that's company. like, that's rule number one, be available, you know. Yeah. Be available to the media. Have your online press kit ready. Respond within, um, you know, very well, quickly. The thing, the thing is, Michelle, they were, they were, and I didn't realize this because the way that they were positioned online, they were positioned as a Silicon Valley company. Um, but it turns out they're actually a company in in Southeast Asia, and wow. so they they have a they have a, a a Silicon Valley mailing address that they probably set up through you know some kind of service because it you know it, it that that lends to their credibility and their trust. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, their their CEO and their staff, programmers, everybody is based out of Singapore, and I'd have, I'd have no way of knowing that. Right. How would you? Now, I want to say one more thing before we move on to number 13. This extends past the interview, everybody. So you cannot blow. Once you've got the interview with somebody like Michael, and then you go online and share that you were just interviewed about that topic, that scoops his topic. And so that's the thing that I'm also sensitive to is when, you know, after an interview, I try to find out from the people, okay, you know, what serves you? You know, when are you going to run it so that I'm not, you know, so that I can help propel, you know, people to visit that, but not before, you know, the, not before the venue is actually ready for that. And I think people forget to be sensitive about that. So just wanted to point that out to people, too, that it extends beyond the interview. Okay, number 13. Yeah, number 13, um, insisting that you, the, the PR pro, be on the call with your client when I interview them. I've, I've run into this a few times. And um, normally when I, when I agree to do an interview or a briefing, I always just give my direct phone number. And, and that's how, you know, like when you're going back and forth between someone who works in PR and you're gauging, they're gauging the journalist's interest and the journalist is writing back and looking at their own capacity, their own editorial plan. Does this make sense for me to cover? Is there really something here? You know, that may result in a briefing or it may result in an interview. And um, so when, once we get to that point, you know, I'll say something to, to the effect of, um, you know, I've got time at, at 3 o'clock on Thursday. Let me know if I should, if I should uh, get that on my calendar for, you know, Samantha to call me then. And I'll put my phone number down. And invariably, the reply will be, 3.30 on Thursday is great. Uh, please use the following conference line with, with this access code. And what that tells me is that, is that the, the PR rep is going to be on the call because there's, there's no reasonable reason why anyone should have to call on a conference line if I'm giving a direct number. And so I'll, you know, sometimes I'll push back. If I feel that I'm dealing with a, uh, a PR pro who is, um, very, very specific, is not willing to reveal anything about what I'm talking about, is just staying completely on task with their pitch and on message with their pitch, isn't themselves willing to give me any background. They're really trying to, you know, and, and you know, good for them, for their client. They're really trying to control this story. They have a very specific goal in mind. But it feels like a controlled situation for me. 
And I've had situations like this in the past where I've been on a call, I've asked a question, and I've actually been interrupted by someone from the communications team or PR saying, oh, you know, Michael, we're, we're not talking about that today. And I got to tell you, that, that just makes me want to talk about it more. Because if I'm asking, if I'm asking the question in the first place, it's because it, it has a place. It's not just because I'm making small talk or conversation or I've got an extra five minutes to kill for the answer. So, um, these sort of insistence, um, are, can, can from time to time get in the way. At the same time, they can actually be very, very helpful. So I may be on a call with a, with a CEO doing an interview about a particular topic. CEO references a white paper. They reference a new algorithm. They reference something that, you know, just was like dropped and it just, boom, it just was mid-sentence and there's no way I'm going to capture it and fully understand it. I may, you know, I may at the end of, at the end of that part of the interview or at the end of the interview, I may say something like, hey, Michelle, I, I know you're on the line. Uh, would you please be able to follow up with Samantha? And uh, get me the uh, get me the white paper she was referring to, and then she also talked about the new pricing schema. Would you be able to document that for me and send it over? That can be really really helpful because the CEO themselves usually doesn't have the time for that. The reason why they're working with you in many cases is because it's easier for them to edit than it is to create. Um, and so with the content that you're creating for them, the pitching that you're doing, you know you're you're their designee, you're their delegate. They trust you to do it, and so it makes sense that they would trust you to sort of manage those details associated with what I'm asking for during a call on follow-up. So it kind of cuts both ways, but it's the insisting part that can get in the way. And I'll also tell you what will get in the way is you recording the call on your side through your conference service. And I've had this happen before where I've actually heard the beeps or I've flat out asked, is this call being recorded? And it was revealed that it was being recorded. Um, and that's well, they're, they're supposed to actually tell you if it's being recorded anyway, aren't they? Isn't well, yeah. that law? Yeah, by law, and every state is a little bit different. You're supposed to tell people. But but I'm finding some PR um, operations are using a conference service where recording is automatic and it's something that you have to turn off. So whether it's left on by mistake or that's their default setting because they've had a bad situation in the past and they want to document any, everything, whatever it is. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's not cool with with me um, on any level um, if I'm being recorded. Um, and at the same time, if I'm recording uh, your you know your client, you know, I, I I damn well better tell you that I'm doing that. Right, I agree. Well, and um, we're getting some questions to come in, and that's great, everybody. I see your questions coming in. Go ahead and send them. Um, one of the questions is, is what's the hashtag again? It's hashtag media pitching. And you can tweet what you're learning on today's call. And we're, there are some questions about some of the previous flaws that we've discussed, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. I want to underscore here that some clients expect for the publicist to be on the call, and I will only do that in pre-interviews. And if I feel that the media training of the client is not up to par with what the actual media contact needs, and I very rarely do that. In fact, I had a potential client who was bad-mouthing a previous publicist, and this was um, a celebrity type of client, and she expected the publicist to be on every single media call in every media interview. And I said in you know, the dance of whether she was going to be our client or not, I said, I probably wouldn't have been on the call with you either. Because that there's an intimacy that needs to happen between source and media contact that when you have a third party in there, it you know it, it it's not fabulous. <laughs> it's not fabulous. And I've and on the flip side, I remember just recently, um, this was another interview with the Wall Street Journal, completely different client, completely different topic, and um, I was just there to kind of facilitate. I, I jumped on the bridge line. And I recorded it only for the benefit of the um, my media contact. She knew it and she appreciated that. She wanted that. And then I actually said, I'm going to get off the call. And then she said, please stay on. And I was like, okay. So, again, you know, this is Michael's perspective, you guys. And the bottom line is, is you've got to know your media contact and ask them what they want. <laughs> you know? And stand up to your client or stand up to, you know, these preconceived notions that it has to be a particular way because people are different and people need different things. And people, you know, what works for one person is not going to work for another. And the only way that you find out is being in communication with them. Wouldn't you agree, Michael? Definitely. And it's it's so simple to start off a relationship with a journalist and, and just ask, what are your needs? 
Yeah. What is it that you're you're actually working on? What does your editorial plan look like? Um, those those go a really really long way towards you know not only um, endearing yourself to the journalist, which isn't the purpose and reason for doing it, but it goes a long way in terms of of not wasting your time or theirs, and just having you know sort of respect for all of that in between and. You know, and, I mean, I could just keep going on this one forever. It's it's respectful of your of your client's time. If they're paying you, you know, if they're if they're on if you have the client on retainer or you know they've got a different revenue model for how you for how you handle it, um, you know, be respectful of that and try to get the you know the most bang for your buck, so to speak. And just asking that question is the way to do it. I have a question for you um, also about that. You know, how are you talking about the CEO using the publicist to kind of do follow up and so forth? What do you think about a uh, freelance writer, high level, like yourself, okay, um, sets up an interview with a publicist. Then the publicist, you know, sends some prep notes, like, okay, here's, you know, some three tips, and this is what they're going to talk about, da 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 da, you know, just to kind of give you an idea, to kind of just be nice, like this is what's going to happen beforehand. And then right before the interview, um, I got a note that said, hey, these notes are really great. I'm just going to use these and not interview your person. What do you think about that? Been there, done that. Really? Yeah. From from my perspective, you know, I'm I'm interested in facts. Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm not always interested in sort of the, um, you know, the the way to sort of gloss it up and you know put some perfume on it and make it smell even better. If it if what you're providing me with is serving my needs for my story, that's that's my side of the equation. My my responsibility as a journalist is not to your client; it's to the reader. And if what I need is included in the briefing that you provide me with, whether it's in writing or or you're or you're doing it over the phone, it, it doesn't matter. I've got what I need. I'm moving on. You you know, you can rest assured that, you know, your client is gonna get is gonna get coverage or get credit for the information that you're sharing with me. And okay. if they okay, don't, well here's the interesting okay. thing is the client freaked out a little bit about, well, is she gonna quote me correctly? And so well, then I requ- and I said, well, you know, can we? I know that this is going to segue into number fourteen, what you're going to talk about next. But you know, I like asked for, okay, if you're going to quote my client, can you at least let my client read his quote? Because I just gave you prep notes, and then so yeah. you know, I haven't gotten that. I bet he gets quoted and attributed to that stuff, and I bet you know well, I didn't get any. So let's yeah, go to number, this is a perfect segue into the next one. I want to hear yeah, here's, what you and, and this actually isn't really dictating how I write, what, what you're describing. So let's, let's just kind of wrap that part up first. Um, if we could just go back to the other slide so we don't confuse anyone who's maybe joining us or thinking this is what I'm talking about. Okay. So um, if that actually happens, Michelle, if, if the information that was provided is, is now serving as a quote, and I literally mean open quotes, close quotes, then, then you have a responsibility to your client and to the readers of that publication to contact the managing editor, to contact the publisher, to contact whoever it is, the editor-in-chief, and indicate this is actually what the journalist did. My client, my client was not quoted. I provided information on background. There was nothing there that said where I put in my notes, according to Drew Gerber, and yet that's what showed up in your publication. I but I have to, to wait for it to come out before I do that. I don't do that before yeah. the publication yeah. date. Yeah, yeah well, okay. well, but but you also then need to, if you're projecting that that's what might happen, yes. you need to go on record with that journalist and send them an email that says, I need to let you know, um, you know that I thank you so much for taking the information on background. It was on background only. Nothing, nothing in there can be quoted or attributed to my client. Um, you're more than welcome to use the information on background, but if you need a quote, you know, we're going to have to talk to the client. Wow, I have that's a little heavy handed. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna give that I'm gonna give that some thought. Okay, I appreciate your perspective. Okay. You have a responsibility to your client and if they don't want to be attributed, if they don't want to be quoted with those words, that language, then you just need to make that clear. Interesting. So you guys, even I'm learning something. I've been doing PR for twenty four years and look how valuable Michael's time is for us. Thank you so much. Can I quote you on that? Please. Okay. (laughs) I expect you to. (laughs) Number fourteen. Yeah, dictating how I write. This is this really flow does flow into the previous one around the uh, you know the notion of wanting to be on the call and really kind of control the story. So you know I might I, I might do some follow up um, after an interview um, that kind of takes a story in a different direction and that might not sit well with you know with you or your client. But again, there are absolutely no guarantees in any of this. 
And I think it's really important that you educate your clients and understand that this is this isn't gambling what we're doing here, although in a sense they are gambling they're gambling their money on you as a PR pro. Um, if if the person listening to this conversation today is 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 a uh, is a public relations professional, um, you know there's there's no guarantee that that you're going to get them on Oprah, on Dr. Oz, on Dr. Phil, um, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, or even on the back page of the the business section of a local hometown newspaper. There's no guarantee of any of it, and so it's all a gamble. And um, you know as as the person responsible for managing those funds. And wanting to get more of those funds next month, you might try to control the story in a way that that would appear to me or occur to me that you're trying to dictate how it is specifically that I'm going to write this piece, and that's never going to sit well with me or with with anyone else, you know, um, sort of like this. So, um, one of the ways that this shows up, uh, sort of a, an example of this, is that if I if I ask you for um, you know, a, a bio of someone that I'm going to be covering, and it's for it's just full of rhetoric and you know hyperbole. Um, in a sense, you're trying to dictate by giving me BS how I write. You're you're using in your in your content um, information that just isn't straightforward, uh, that isn't factual, and so you, you know you want to you want to avoid all of that because it does it does come across as dictating. Yeah, and I think that it's really important because I tell my clients, if you're going to dictate to that media contact what to write or say, go pay for advertising. That's called advertising because you control what you say when you advertise. In PR and earned editorial, um, it's you know to me it's a dance and like trying to dictate what you uh, you know what my media contacts are saying or doing is like trying to dance with you and then force you into some type of. You know, I don't know. I just that to me is always a pet peeve of mine working with clients, and I just I really stand up to people um, when they're when they want me to say that to a client. It really or to a media contact because I really I think that's a boundary that people cross, and it drives me nuts. Moving into the next one, which is <laughs> I get asked to do this as well. Go ahead yeah. with number fifteen. Yeah, asking for unnecessary corrections once an article is published. So this this happens more often than I'd like it to. And I think in this day and age when uh, publishing is such a commodity, there are so many different outlets that you can go to to get your news and information published, including your own. You mentioned a phrase before, Michelle, earned media. Um, but there's also owned media where you have yes. the opportunity to tell that story yourself on your own blog and your own social profiles and so forth and so on. In this day and age where you're, you or your client are used to making corrections all day long to something, because you rush to put it up, or the information has changed, or you want to, you know, basically, you know, rechange the record, so to speak, because you realize, oh, the language I used wasn't right, or it didn't look flattering, or it didn't really work for what I was trying to trying to get across. Uh, while you can do that on your owned properties, you can't assume that it's just as easy for me, because we're using a content management system online in some cases, to have something corrected, and especially if it's a really, really minor point. Um, and you know, I, I don't, I don't have a a, a 100% specific example here, but I would just say that recognize that my time is valuable, and that if you're if you're peppering me with with corrections and they're not all sent at once, or um, it's uh, you know, let's say that I reported a figure like 171 million, um, but you contact me the next day and say, oh no, that was wrong. It's actually 174 million. Well, I'm probably not going to bug the editorial team at a publication I write for, if it's online, to get that changed mm -hmm. because their time is valuable too, mm -hmm. and that actually speaks to my own credibility. I don't right. want to go. I don't, I don't want to go in front of my editorial board as the guy who's always sending through corrections because it means I can't be counted on to to get it right the first time. And I, there's a litmus test that I usually use with clients that say, when you ask for that correction, it's about facts. So if they've gotten a fact incorrect that you've clarified in the interview, then we can ask for the correction. But if it's just because you don't like the way you were quoted, but you said that or you sent that, it, it comes up in crisis communications that we do all the time because they're like, well, we got to get a correction, you know, because they're under this crisis communication situation. And what we say is, but is it factual? And is it factual from a different perspective? And if the answer is yes, then guess what? 
the editorial board is probably not going to issue a correction regardless. So the only thing that you can do is tell your side of the story in owned media. And by the way, if these terms are like, what are they saying? Owned media are things like your website, Facebook, Twitter, things that you own and control. Paid media, think of advertising. Earned media would be things like you know, a third party, third party talking about you or using you as a source or discussing you in news. It's what we're talking about in, in traditional PR, earned editorial coverage. Um, so number 16, and then we're going to get to Q&As. Yeah, so number 16, this, is, this one is definitely out there on the edge, and I thought it was important to put it in because it, it again speaks to the day and age that we're working in when it comes to, uh, when it comes to both print and online media. So I've mentioned a number of times before that, uh, that, the, written, that the written word has, has become a commodity, that anyone and their grandmother or grandfather or niece and nephew or uncle or dog can hang up a shingle and say that they're reporting the news, that they're a journalist, that they're doing whatever they want to do. All they have to do is rank well for it, find an audience for it, publicize it, promote it, and they are now writing. So there are so many different places now where your news and information can appear, which means that a lot of publishers have turned to a completely different revenue model for compensating for news or the writing of news or information or feature stories or whatever that might be. So you still have in, in traditional print, you know, you get paid by the word um, for most publications. And so you might get 25 cents a word, $3 a word, $10 a word, depending on what kind of journalist you are, what kind of following you have. But online, increasingly, journalists um, are, are being paid based on eyeballs. So you'll find that, um, you know, that a story will be written, it'll appear online, and the way that the journalist is being compensated for that might be in part, you know, a, a small stipend or a small monthly fee, but the bulk of their payment is actually going to come from the number of unique views that that content has received, the number of return visitors that that content has received. There's going to be some kind of formula there. So if, if a journalist has written a story um, that features your client, your company, um, or you yourself, and they, they, you know, they turn around to you and they let you know that it's been published, they provide a link, and you're not doing anything to help promote that content. And by anything, I mean just the simplest of things, asking the client to tweet about it, asking the client to post an update to Facebook about it or LinkedIn or any other social networking site. If the client has a website, or again, if you yourself are the entrepreneur and you're listening into this call today, if you have a website and you have an in-the-news section or a press section or a blog of your own, and you're not promoting the content there, you're, you're really not doing any favors for the journalist. And you might say, well, I have no responsibility to the journalist. And you're 100% absolutely correct. You have no responsibility other than those responsibilities that you have to your client. But if you like the content, you think it's valuable, it positions your, your business or brand or your client's business or brand in a positive light, and you're just literally skipping that step of socializing the content, you're not endearing yourself to the journalist, and especially if the journalist has made an outward appeal to you and they've bulleted for you, maybe even in an email message, hey, the story's live, just wanted to let you know that it's there, um, you know, would love it if you're able to socialize it through the following means and they provide a bullet list of what to do and you don't do anything, um, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of messing up at least in the, the politics of the whole equation nowadays. I just can't even, I'm trying to wrap my head around somebody who wouldn't help socialize the content and maybe it I makes sense example. if yeah, it, I, give, well, I, I give you the are you example okay go ahead yeah go so ahead the, the direct example is that the client or the uh, the the source refused and 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 literally came out and 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 said why and it was because one particular aspect of the story didn't or, or the pitch didn't become a part of the story and so because of that their their participating partner in all of this because that partner wasn't mentioned, they literally refused to socialize it. And they had an audience that was just huge, a huge, huge audience. It's a major, major player. And because they refused to, to socialize it, you know, the the eyeballs on it, the views, the page views, you know, unique or returns, you know, they definitely were lower than the publisher would have liked to have seen, but they were respectable. They, you know, they were fine. I mean, we're not, we don't, we don't only do this to get paid. We do this because we enjoy writing and getting news and information out there in many cases. Um, so it wasn't a heartbreaker. But then I had it happen myself. I actually had it happen again with, with something completely different, um, where, you know, for a different reason, they absolutely refused to socialize it. And, you know, the piece was a dud. It's got great information in it. 
um, but you know a particular audience never got to see it because someone actually you know refused to, to do anything with it. Oh, it's just incredible to me. I mean, I, the only way that I would refuse to socialize content is if it was just flat out factual uh, errors and they wouldn't correct them. You know what I mean? Like it would be it, it would be yeah. uh, damaging to the reputation is the only reason why I would say, you know, no to... Yeah, or it's a hit bit. piece or something like that, of course. Yeah. yeah. So um, in summary, what we've talked about is, uh, let's just go over that. <clears throat> so we've got operating without a media distribution list, not recognizing the Matthew effect, ignoring capacity, the actual media context capacity, that is, pitching without a cover, insisting you be on the call with your client when you're interviewed, dictating how the media person writes, asking for unnecessary corrections once an article has published. Remember the litmus test that I suggested was, is it factual or not, and that's it, and refusing to help socialize content. So what we're going to do is now go into Q&A. I do have some questions. We're going a little bit over, but I think we're going to have time for the questions that we have. I'm going to uh, combine some of them, okay? So one of the questions is, this comes from New York, and um, I don't have a first name, um, but it looks like ISLPR. Hi, welcome. Another publicist here. So as a publicist, my frustration is not getting any feedback from journalists. While I understand Michael's stance, it is my job to get responses from my client. They don't want to hear, oh, we sent a press release or left a message and got no response. Do journalists take that into account? It is not easier to just tell the publicist not interested. It, or isn't it just as easy uh, to hit reply and with an email to say thanks but no thanks than to keep us uh, to keep trying to get your an answer from you? What do you think, Michael? Well, you, I mean, this is yeah. Sorry, sorry, not really your job, right? To manage that client's expectations. <laughs> That's one thing yeah. that comes to my mind. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, this sounds brutal and and harsh, and uh, I really can't apologize for it. But that's not my concern. Um, uh, again, I, I receive, I mentioned this during the first webinar that we did on this topic, that I receive anywhere between 25 and 50 pitches a day. And that, that's no joke. That's no kidding, either by phone or email. Uh, thankfully, not by fax. Um, and with that kind of capacity, with those kind of numbers coming in, there's just no time for me to respond to everybody. And if you follow up, um, you know, there, there's a better chance that I'll reply. If you follow up three times, maybe there's an even better chance because now I've seen it three times, and I've got empathy for you. I mean, but I'm not every I'm not every journalist, um, especially if you're pitching to a to a just a regular old um, email address, you know, like uh, you know PR or pitches at uh, you know xyzmediacorp.com. If you expect to get replies and you're telling your client that you that you pitched XYZ Media Corp and you're not hearing back from them and it's just a general email address, um, you know you're you're not doing yourself any any favors in that regard. But at the end of the day, that concern is is not my concern, and you need to manage that on your own. Yeah. And, and I apologize if that sounds harsh. I don't think it sounds harsh. I think some people might, but the the other truth is is that successful business people will often say the words, "Well, what's in it for me." It doesn't mean that they're greedy or that they're self-centered, but they're just smart business people because they actually invest their time and their money wisely. And so when I'm with a business person who says that to me, if I'm rattling on at a cocktail party about something and I want them to maybe participate with me, if they say something like that to me, I know I'm, I'm with somebody who's successful. Does that make sense, Michael? Does that, you know, like I'm saying, like, if somebody's actually questioning, hey, you know, what is the investment of time and money in this conversation or in this participation, most business people are going to get that. Right. And, I, and that's why I think that for media people, you know, when we're working with our clients and, and then we don't get a response from a media person, it's our job to really, you know, explain to that client what it's like in the world of a media person, and they're only going to be responsive to us if we interest them in what we're doing. And so no response means no play. Yeah. Okay, so then there's another thing, um, a question here about, um, there's, this is actually from San, San Antonio, and it's a media person who's uh, gone into retirement and now actually publicizing himself. And so he writes the person on the web page to talk about the promotions and so forth, and he just wants to know, what am I doing wrong? You know, because he's actually going to the websites and saying, hey, I'd like for you to um, cover this. So we, it's actually a media person turned PR, do-it-yourself publicist. So 
do you have any thoughts about you know maybe media people doing their own publicity publicity now? Um, no, I mean I'm kind of confused by the question because it it doesn't matter if this person is a former auto mechanic or a former media person. I mean that 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 has that has no bearing on on the situation whatsoever. What has a bearing is why is it newsworthy? I mean it it sounds to me like it's a if this person is pitching themselves and not getting any response, it sounds to me like there's a problem with their pitch. And that could be for any number of reasons. They're pitching the wrong people. Um, they're coming across the wrong way. They're not being resourceful enough. They're not being helpful enough. Um, you know, if if I could sort of uh, you know encourage PR people and, pe- and and organizations that are pitching themselves, or in this particular case, someone who is an individual pitching himself, I would I would encourage you to really take to heart the notion that this isn't about you. This is about what you know. This is about the information that you have access to that you feel can be helpful to others. It's, you know, in, in, unless you're talking about profile pieces. And, you know, one of the publications that I write for does contain a lot of profile pieces because they're, um, you know, they're, they're encouraging for other people and people like to get that inspiration. But that's not what the whole publication is about. And, you know, because I write for this one particular publication, I'll get a lot of pitches that are very much along the lines of really think you should write a profile piece on so-and-so. And my response is, is always, here's what I do write about. I write what are called newsy how-tos. I take a combination of something that's in the news now, should be in the news now, or is still top of mind, report on that from a news perspective, and then apply a how-to filter to that showing the reader what this means to you and your life or your business or whatever it might be. That's my primary approach. It doesn't mean that everything that I write falls within that that scope, but a big chunk of what I write does fall within that scope. And so if you know that, if you get that it's that in the writing that I do that it's not about you, but it's about what you know, it's about your thought leadership, your expertise, and instead maybe this person is currently pitching, you know, trying to get profiles written on themselves, instead of, of doing that, they should maybe take a, a you know a, a turn and and say listen you know here's a topic that you may want to write about i want to let you know that i'm a i'm a subject matter expert on this and you know here are here are my top 5 points that you should feel free to quote me on at any time but of course i'd i'd love to talk to you with you you know by phone would with, with 2 o'clock on thursday work so if you shift the focus from you to the topic i think you'll you'll probably get uh, you know you'll probably get more more hits and you all should rewind and replay what Michael just said because he just laid out a pitch formula for you, by the way. And like we said earlier, if you're, if you're, which is, it's not fair to all the media people out there, but if we make it succinct and you think about it this way, print and broadcast just helps people kind of get into the world. Um, print, generally, they want to be educated. So how can you educate your print media contact, okay? And then... Broadcast people, they generally like to entertain. They like to entertain their radio uh, listeners or their TV viewers. So how can you bring an an entertainment or educational value, especially like if it's a a morning show? They want both. So think about that. And then also this particular uh, person talks about a novel. So if you've got a fictional novel, think about seasonal and breaking news tie-ins. At Wasabi, years ago, we had a novelist who did a fictional story on human trafficking. It was gripping. It was really wonderful. We pulled out every study on human trafficking. We pulled out every breaking news story on human trafficking and then pulled in uh, news coverage for that particular novelist. Now, there's a last question here that we have time for today is um, about, you know, corrections, whether they're appropriate or not. And the question comes from Atlanta saying, right, if it says shredding, not shedding, we should ask for a, a correction. And, you know, an obvious typo, right? That's okay. Right, Michael? Except, yeah. for the t- except for the one that you were talking about with, oh, you, you were just told the wrong amount inside the interview. But if it's an obvious typo, of course, right? Yeah, if there, if there are typos and uh – you know, you, you want to point out to the writer, gosh, you know, I, I, I don't think your copy editor actually read this before it was published, and it looks bad for your business and brand. I don't mean your client's business and brand, but you mean the, the publishing business and brand because the client is the, the content is just so awful. Um, yeah, you, you should definitely, you know, sort of assert yourself and point out, hey, I read the article yesterday. I really, really appreciate the coverage. I want to let you know in the fifth paragraph, 
um, you know, second sentence, third word is supposed to be, uh, you know, shredding and not shedding. Whatever yeah, good. It might be. That, that, well, and that, the same per- the same person um, also asked during our um, our discuss- discussion about the social media, you know, and how we're actually pitching via social media, and they wanted my perspective on that. Okay, here's the thing: is that and they say, you know, that your position, Michael, is actually opposite of what uh, a lot of other pitching training programs are teaching. So congratulations. We've got a minority view that's being shared with um, in a fresh way. I love it. <laughs> um, here's the thing, you guys. It's a relationship and a dance with that person. Okay, so Michael is telling you what works for him, and it's going to work for a lot of writers who are like him. And there are going to be other media contacts who loathe being pitched by a C- via social media. I was on a, a, a tele- well, well, it was actually a webinar, that one was, uh, from a very well-known training program for publicists and I was listening to them and most of the stuff on the call was completely redundant and then they started to tell everybody that people don't like phone calls today and I wrote in and I said wrong <laughs> are you crazy I mean I'm not going to mention who they are but they actually saw my viewpoint and they expressed it on the webinar for everybody like look we've got a publicist who's been doing this for 24 years and she says telephone still works so I love, I love. Yeah, I have. I, I love getting phone calls. Right. You know, if I if I have if I have time to answer the phone, I'll answer it. And if I have time to talk to you, I'll I'll let you know that that I, yeah, I've got five minutes. Let's go. And if I don't answer the call, it might be because I'm physically not there, or it might be because I saw caller ID and it says you know, HCOM, and I know that HCOM is a firm and that they're just going to be pitching me, and you know, I'm on task right now and I just don't have time for it. Right. Um, you know, I'm I'm flattered that anyone, quite frankly, would want to talk to me. And maybe they've got issues with self esteem. But I have you know, I have no problem getting, you know, hundreds of emails a day or dozens of phone calls a day. Yes, it can feel a little bit overwhelming, but at the same time it's flattering that someone would actually trust me with their news and information and give me an opportunity to tell that story. So, you know, I'm I'm a little bit different in this regard. You know, I um you know, you you've heard me you've heard me say that the that the open social pitching is doesn't work for me because it, it conflicts with what my editorial plan is and the way that I like my you know the news to be announced so to speak. Um, I've shared before that the piling on effect um, really doesn't work for me. I'm a bit of a socialist in this regard. You know I want I want to share the news, but I also don't want to you know help the rich get richer. Um, I have no problem with the rich per se if they're the ones that are telling the story and they've got the news and they're the only ones that can comment on it. You know, and it's a good story. I'm going to go to them. I don't care how many times they've been mentioned. That's if right. It needs to be, yeah, if it needs to be covered, it'll be covered. But if I have my druthers and there's a competitor and they've got something to say about it, I'm probably going to go with them. But to your point, Michelle, that this is just what I think. That's exactly correct. And and journalism has become such a commodity that you're going to find a ton of different viewpoints on this. So no one here, myself included, is absolutely indefensible and correct in the advice that they're giving. Not the training organizations that are telling you you should use social to pitch and not me for telling you that you shouldn't. Right. I mean, it boils down to, in the last webinar, we talked about the pitch, really, and now we're talking about the play. And the bottom line is, I mean, I said it before, you guys, I've seen PR transition from typewriters to Twitter. You know, maybe I'm a little bit old school, but the truth of it is it boils down to relationships. It boils down to will that media person actually take your phone call? You know, and if they will, then good for you. Bully for you. You've actually succeeded in making a friend in the media. And that, at the bottom, at the end of the day, that's what counts because that's who they're going to take their sources from. And so it's been really, really great. And Michael has told you he loves to hear from you. You can see that this is how you can reach him. We've got Twitter, email, and web. The same for me. So if you've got further questions, something that we didn't answer, we are out of time and we're actually over by 15 minutes. We've chucked this full of information for you, and I hope it's been valuable. Definitely tweet about it. If you're listening to this in the future, past the live broadcast of this, then still tweet about it. Hashtag media pitching. We'd love to hear from you. Now, we are going to have the last and final one in the series. It's going to be Thursday, November 17th. The topic may include actual live interactions with people doing some pitching. So if you're interested in that, please go to pitchrate.com and make sure that you're getting the live feeds um, that actually publicize the event so that we can actually include you in participation. So thanks so much, and thanks again, Michael, for spending your time with us today. 
Hey, I, I know that we've run over, but I feel kind of awkward if we don't do this. Could Go you ahead. Could you just take one minute and explain what pitchrate.com is? Oh, good. Oh, great. Yeah, pitchrate.com is a – it's sort of like match.com between – publicists or sources and media contacts. Okay, so um, for people like you, Michael, like let's say you're working, like, well, what are you working on something right now, for example, There's something generic that you're working on? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not giving you my story. Oh, that's right. right. We can't scoop it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's say that you're talk. I know, let's say that you're working um, on a story about dogs at the office, okay, some pets at your office. Let's just say you're writing about that. You could go on to pitchrate.com and make a query and say, hey, I'm looking for people, actual business people who have their pets in the office or on experts on why that reduces stress in the office, you know, or how it can affect your bottom line or something like that. And then the people at pitchrate sources that are there either vets or psychologists or business people themselves, then pitch you. The difference in this free media lead service than others is that it pitch it rates according to the appropriateness of your query. Hmm. So, you know, it'll actually say, okay, this is a five star fit or this is a three star fit. Got it's it. kinda Great. nice. Yeah. You know. So it's just sources and stuff. Yeah, sorry, I kind of skipped over that for everybody. If you're new to Pitch Raid and, you know, lots of media people like to use that, and um, especially if you are a source and you're listening to this call or learning about it, definitely go over there and check it out. All right, thanks, Michael, for bringing that up. Yeah, sure. And thanks. I'll see you then next time. Okay, thanks for having Bye-bye. me. Bye. Thank you.